Welcome back. Well, today I flipped a coin to see what the subject of our video was going to be. And I figured if it was heads, I was going to bring out a pair of scissors and cut my hair for you. Because if I don't do something with it pretty soon, it's just, it's a mess. It's going everywhere. I'm going completely nuts with this. Or I would tell you what I have been binge watching on YouTube uh, during the past couple of weeks. And lucky you, it was Tales. We're going to talk about YouTube. You're just going to have to wait to watch me butcher my hair for some other time. We'll be right back. As you all know, I have been binge watching uh, videos about Meghan and Harry to the point where I'm starting to talk about them the way I talk about my cousins, you know. Eventually, of course, shame, just pure shame, moved me in another direction. Now, we had mentioned previously when we were talking, I had started watching Ask a Mortician. Uh, with Caitlin Doty. And Caitlin is a, a mortician. Um, it's it, it's really not all that surprising when you look at her because she has this little sort of, you know, queen of the night thing going for her. Just a little bit of a goth kind of thing. Uh, she is very, very entertaining. And if you are not squeamish about death, her videos are absolutely uh, riveting because she talks about a whole bunch of taboo subjects and she talks about a bunch of very interesting subjects. Um, the incorruptible bodies of saints, we've all heard about that. Um, she, she's just wonderful at this. Uh, she talks about Victorian funeral practices. Um, all kinds of things. It's just a, a whole gamut of things. And she also talks a lot about the funeral industry. Now, with my generation, uh, we are more likely to remember um, Jessica Mitford, which was, I believe, what was the American way of death, or perhaps it was the American way of dying, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the title. Jessica Mitford. That I'm not drawing a blank about. She wrote a very engaging book about funeral practices in the United States. It was an eye-opening experience for a lot of us. And I'm thinking it was probably the late 50s or early 60s when she wrote that book. It was, it was many years ago. Uh, I was quite young when she wrote it. And she blew the whistle on all kinds of practices. Um, the, the techniques that funeral home owners would use to encourage people, well, encouraged to guilt people into spending more money than they could afford for funerals. Um, just, it was full of utter horror stories, not the least of which, it was, this is one of my favorite stories, it was about a fellow whose mother had passed, and this guy was a funeral director's dream come true. He wanted everything. He wanted a sealed casket, and he wanted a vault for the casket, and he wanted this, and he wanted that, because he adorned his mother, and he wanted to make sure her body was preserved forever and ever and ever, and of course, they gave him all this stuff, and he would go out to see her crypt day after day, and one day, there was some ooze coming out of the crypt. 
Needless to say, all the nonsense they had sold him with the promises of Mama would not decay absolutely came to nothing in the end. And that was the sort of thing that Jessica was, or Jessica Mipper was writing about. One of the most striking uh, sections of her book was the comparison between what Franklin Delano Roosevelt wanted for his funeral and what he got. Because he, he died in office, he got a full state funeral. And apparently he wanted something very simple. And it was just like line for line. This is what he wanted. This is what he got. So we have had this before. Recently, Mary Roach, uh, she's a young author, um, has written a book, uh, Stiff. It's called Stiff. And she discussed what happens after one dies. Uh, it's, it's very interesting that it seems to be women who are at the forefront of opening the dialogue about these things. And I consider Caitlin Doty to be a successor to Jessica Midford, uh, Mary Roach, the people who are saying, this is what you think's going on, but in reality, this is what's happening. So if you have any interest in what becomes of one's mortal remains, she's well worth watching. Also, she's hysterically funny. I mean, I really find her to be a scream. It's, I cannot get through a single one of her videos without cracking up. So ask a mortician, Caitlin Doty. Another one that I have been watching is Reading the Past. And this is with Dr. She never gives her full name, but I have seen it in the credits somewhere. Dr. Katrina Marchand, I believe. Uh, I started watching her channel, Reading the Past. Couldn't have been more than 10 days ago. And she only had a couple thousand subscribers. I'm sure by now it's over 20,000. I think YouTube has put her on one of their, you know, recommended cycles. You know how they have those recommended videos that are running down the right-hand margin of your screen. I think that's what's happened. Suddenly she's taken off. I think a lot of people are looking to her for some COVID quarantine company. Uh, I've been binge watching her and at this point I believe I have watched all but two of her videos. She is a very good historian. Her specialty is Tudor era, era England, which happens to be one of my favorite historical periods for research. It's not like I want to go live there or anything but for historical research. And the first video of hers that I watched was, um, it's, I don't recall the title, something about the staircase, because Amy Robsart Dudley died at the foot of a staircase. Now, who is she, you're thinking? Um, she was the wife of Robert Dudley, who was Queen Elizabeth I's uh, intimate friend and alleged lover. And suddenly his inconvenient wife, who he had virtually abandoned, shows up dead at the foot of the stairs. And she discusses this. And mind you, this is an age-old mystery. No one was ever determined to have been the cause of the death. The cause of the death was what mischance um, was it mischance? Who knows? But it's a, it, it's a mystery that touched very close to the heart of the Tudor court. Um, I have always thought that if I were going to fictionalize that story, my take on it would be that 
the, the abandoned wife of the queen's lover who reportedly had been recently diagnosed with breast cancer, which would have been fatal, realizes that she is about to die and enlists someone to help her exit this world in a way that would guarantee that her husband would never be able to run away with his lover. Because if his wife was assumed to, or even thought, even if there was a suspicion that his wife died as a result of foul play, the Queen of England would never be able to marry him. So that's my own take on it. So I would say absolutely watch those videos. Watch the Amy Robsart video and see whether or not you think I'm right. Who, uh, actually, I don't know if I'm right. I really don't. I just thought that would be one of the more interesting scenarios that should be, could be, maybe ought to be fictionalized at some point. I think it would be an engaging short story. But be that as it may, Dr. Cat and Reading the Past is fascinating. The woman is a wonderful historian. She certainly knows her field, just like um, Caitlin Doty, who certainly knows her field. And it's a field that not all of us are exposed to readily. It's, it's um, very few of us know very much about mortuary sciences. Very few of us know very much about Tudor England. Um, I, I know rather a lot about it because it's an historical interest of mine. Some of our viewers also know rather a lot about it. And I've mentioned before that one of our viewers in particular is an authority on the court paintings of Tudor England. Uh, and she's done a, a, a lot of work with that. She, she identified a formerly unknown painting by a great Flemish court painter, which I think is astounding. Um, that's just... I can't even wrap my head around that. That's such a magnificent achievement. So we do have people that are interested in this period. But this is the time of Elizabeth I. This is the time of Shakespeare. This is the time of John D. Elizabeth I, psychoastrologer. Uh, and he was definitely different. Uh, this was uh, a wonderful time in English history. All kinds of stuff was just going on. Um, I, I There's no lack of material. So even though I have watched all but, like I say, maybe two, two, possibly three of the Reading the Past videos, no lack of stuff for further videos. I'm waiting for the Mary Queen of Scots videos because those should be a great deal of fun um, because Mary Queen of Scots definitely had a checkered early life. So, hey, fantastic. I can hardly wait. But I'm delighted that this channel was discovered. It's just, it's, it's just so wonderful to watch an academic have their work recognized. That is just amazing, uh, especially on YouTube. You know, you think of YouTube as, oh, the little social media stars and the influencers and, you know, and here's the teenage girl putting on makeup and blah, blah, blah. Well, it's wonderful that, you know, here is the historian, you know, it's good for all of us. So reading the past with Dr. Cat. Check it out. And the third one is The Closet Historian. And I found this video when YouTube recommended to me uh, a video about vintage shoes. I have no idea why they thought I was interested in vintage shoes. But the truth is, I was because I watched the video. 
Um, and as you know, I most likely watched the video because it kept me away from the Harry and Meghan show, and I, I got I to gotta back off that. I mean, I'm starting to feel like a heroin addict. It's like I'm just wondering what these people are up to. Um, this one, uh, a young woman, I believe her name is Bianca Esposito. Again, she doesn't announce her name in the show. Just kind of pieced it together from watching a number of her videos. She is a person who dresses from the mid-century and uh, 30s, 40s, 50s. She uh, collects the clothing. She wears it, uses it. Uh, this is not cosplaying. This is simply what she does, which I think is fabulous because this is such an expression of her individuality. It's just astounding. Uh, good for her. But her background is in fashion design. She apparently has a degree in, uh, in fashion design. So in addition to, uh, to collecting and thrifting these fabulous vintage articles of clothing and jewelry and just fashion in general, She's also a seamstress, and she makes her own pieces. And that engages me because I sew. I used to sew. I sew. It's like riding a bicycle. You never forget how to do it once you've done it, even though I have not touched my machine for any more than, you know, uh, stitching up tears in sheets so I can use them for drop cloths. That really, that's the last time I have my sewing machine out. That's what I did. So I don't sew regularly or routinely anymore, but I can sew. So I like watching someone else who knows what they're doing. She does. There's, there's no question. She is definitely a competent seamstress, which I guess you have to be if you want to be a clothing designer. What I find interesting and what I think those of you who follow along with thrifting YouTube shows are going to find interesting is she is thrifting this clothing. Now she is thrifting it for her own purposes. She's buying it. She's collecting it. It stays in her wardrobe. Nevertheless, all you have to do is spend a few minutes listening to how much she says she will pay for a nice 1950s hat or a pretty 1940s suit for you to realize that she is a fabulous resource if you want to start buying and selling vintage mid-century clothing. She knows what it is. She can certainly help you identify it. You watch those videos. She is going to not just show you this is a 1940s outfit, but she will explain how to identify a 1940s outfit. She talks about this all the time in her videos. Well, this is a little less structured than that. And, you know, when the bigger shoulder pads were early 1950s, all kinds of information like that's right there. She's just spilling it out. And this, if you are thinking about dealing in vintage clothing, this is going to be a fabulous resource, just fabulous, because of the amount of information she throws out. And as I say, when you hear what she feels are reasonable prices for these items, you're going to see that thrifting mid-century vintage fashion is lucrative no question about it. If you can come up with this stuff, the prices are really, really good. For me, because I don't deal in clothing, I find it so interesting that she has amassed this wonderful mid-century wardrobe, that she's using it, um, that she is making clothing uh, from um, She's making clothing from her own patterns, so she's making patterns. Uh, the, this is just wonderful as a resource. And as I say, it's an expression of her individuality, which I think is great. So 
if you are interested in this, it's The Closet Historian. And her videos are not long. They're usually in the range of maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And so many of them are vintage fashion shows that you can just sit there and watch all day long. I know I can, and I've done it. Um, I'm binge watching, just sitting back saying, oh, shoes, oh, let's look summer clothes, let's look, just, oh, suits, let's look, because I think that is, is some of the most beautiful fashion ever. Uh, I know a lot of people get all wrapped up in, you know, in Renaissance velvets and Victorian, you know, laces and then Edwardian bustles and whatnot. For me, it's 20th century fashion. Just magnificent. Really, really lovely. Um, so those are the three that I have been watching because I'm trying to stay away from Harry and Meghan. You know, it's just it's not good for me. And they're really not my cousins, no matter how I think of them. So we need to move along. But one of the things I was noticing when I was switching from one video to another is I have a type. Didn't know I had a type, but I do. I look at these three young women. I would not be surprised if they were all perhaps within five years of one another in terms of their ages. If you line them all up, you'd probably swear they were sisters. Uh, dark hair, uh, robust women, buxom. Remember, that was our word, and Funk had said that it meant fatness, and no, actually it meant... Uh, yeah, I have a type. Apparently, this is what I like to watch. Uh, what can I say? So, there's a common thread going through that. It, perhaps it's visual. Uh, perhaps it's historical. Because, let's face it, closet historian, uh, reading the past, and ask a mortician dealing with uh, the, the corpses of dead popes. Maybe it's the historical element in it. But I don't know. It's like, maybe I have a thing for brunettes. Who knows? All right. So those are the three channels I have been watching. If you have a chance, check them out. You may like them, may not be your cup of tea, but I find them very, very engaging. So we didn't have a chance to do this, whoa, to do this last time because yesterday's video went over quite a bit. So how about we go back to a little bit of word origins? <laughs> Wrong way up. Last time we were talking about games. So let's continue with games. Chess, the king is dead. When chess players call check as a warning to an opponent, they are really saying, Mind your king, he's in danger. Both the words check and chess originated in the Far East back somewhere in the dim ages and both come from the Persian word shah or king. The term shah worked down through Arabic into Old French as eshek and into Middle English as check and finally uh, to check. Um, the first one was spelled C-H-E-K, the second C-H-E-C-K, which first only signified check as it is used in a chess game, but later logically came to mean stop, loss, or hindrance, as it does in modern English. The companion word chess entered Middle, middle English as chess from Old French, uh, from the Old French word eshex, uh, which is merely the plural form of a check that gave us the word check. That is, chess is simply a series of checks. When a Persian in ancient days had his opponent's king hopelessly cornered, he announced, Shamat, that is, the king is dead. 
If you pronounce those Persian words, you will not be very far from the modern chess player's phrase, checkmate. Q. First, a tail. The long tapering stick that we use in billiards takes its name from the Latin cauda, tail. The spelling form is greatly changed, but this is natural, for the game of billiards was popular and played by all classes, and the name of the stick that is used in the game passed through dozens of dialects before it emerged as co and then q. Our word Q, Q-U-E-U-E, is exactly the same term, but its form was adopted from the modern French spelling. Its common meaning, of course, is pigtail. But other things can be long and tapering, too, like the Q that waits for the second show at the movies. All right, how about one more, and we'll say good night for the moment. Uh, forfeit originally a crime. With us, a forfeit is not much more than a penalty in games. As Augustine Daly said in one of his plays back in the 80s, by that he means the 1880s, because this was 1950, I wish to gracious we could have one of those old-fashioned forfeit games where kissing comes in. My goodness. They were lively little folks back in the 80s. But in old English days, a forfeit was a crime, as was a forfait in old French. If you were discovered committing a forfait, you were arrested. This French word is a compound of the old French word for, outside, and fait, done. Hence, it literally means done outside or beyond and thus beyond the bounds of the law. This led to the original meaning of transgression, and transgress itself simply means to step across, that is, across the legal line. A sister word of forfeit is counterfeit from the French word contrefaire, uh, imitate or make parallel with. I did not know that, uh, that counterfeit and forfeit were so closely related. I love learning new things. All right. Have a great day, everyone. We will be back here tomorrow. Enjoy your time indoors. It's starting to look like the quarantine will be lifted within a couple of weeks, at least in some places. Our subscribers are telling us that it's being lifted in a lot of areas right now. So for those of you who are allowed to go out and about, oh, congratulations. I do envy you. For the rest of us, like I say, I'm here for the duration. As long as you are stuck in, I will be making videos. I don't want you to think you are alone or abandoned. Remember what we had said before, if you are feeling stressed, if you are alone, if you, if you need someone to reach out to, let me know in the comments. We have people already saying they're more than happy to reach out to others who may be in need. So remember, this is your community. Your community is here for you. Have a great day. I will see you all tomorrow.